Welcome, my name is Matthew, and in this two-segment video, we're going to talk about, well, by we I mean me, I'm going to talk about vectors. And some of my other recent videos have been in multiple segments, like up to six different segments. I'm going to do this video in two segments. The first one's going to be, I don't really know how long they're going to be. I think the first one's going to be a little bit longer than the second one. The first one is going to cover topics like scalar multiplication, adding and subtracting vectors. I'm going to sketch some vectors on the coordinate plane. I'm gonna take vectors, which they look sort of like arrows, just so you know, it's a directed line segment. Um, and we're gonna break them down into their I and J unit vectors. So the horizontal and vertical components that make up all vectors. Then we'll pass briefly over the operations, like being able to add and subtract them, and is there an order of operations? Can we use properties like the commutative property or the associative property, especially when we're uh, also incorporating multiplying the vectors by a scalar, so a number scaling the vectors up or down, making them quote unquote longer or shorter. And then vectors have a magnitude and a direction and we can talk about the direction by using a theta value rotated up from the positive x-axis. That would be a positive theta value. So we'll talk about the angle of direction. And then the last topic, which will be the second segment of this uh, conversation about vectors, will be the application problems. And I want to look at two application problems with you. And they are detailed. And so I'm going to put those into a second segment for you. But let's take care of the first segment first. First things first, and we'll start out talking about scalar multiplication. Oh, except here I am at the at the end looking at applied problems. All right, that's better. We're taking it from the top, and vectors are directed line segments, as I mentioned before, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to move through this segment fairly quickly. It's still like six or seven pages worth of notes. Um, but it's not a super complicated, really heady kind of a topic. Um, so my hope is that this proves to be maybe easier than anything else that we have covered in this course so far. So a directed line segment or a vector has both magnitude and direction. And two vectors like V and W right down here, can be, you could say, aiming in the same direction. They might end up having the same theta value associated with them. So they're aiming in the same direction and they have the same magnitude. Now magnitude is not super specific. And to say that a vector has length is almost totally wrong because the actual vector, like in reality, is not tangible, like pushing with a certain amount of force. Uh, force isn't really something that you see. You don't see the force itself, typically. So these lines and the lengths of the lines or directed line segments relative to each other are going to depict, generally speaking, what we call magnitude. But it could be an amount of force, force exerted by wind, force exerted by gravity, um, and we'll see some other examples of that as we go along. Here our two vectors have the same magnitude, but they're aiming in different directions. Here they have the same magnitude, but they are aiming in opposite directions. So I would say that those two vectors are still parallel. These vectors are parallel. And these vectors are parallel because they're aiming in the same direction. So same direction or opposite direction we will discover in a later section, not just a later segment, but in a later section. I think even the next section when we talk about dot products, we'll look at a method for determining whether or not two vectors are parallel. Uh, but here they are parallel even though they have a different magnitude. You should also look in the very top right corner of your screen and see that a vector has an initial point and a terminal point. So this vector is starting at point P and it's ending at point Q. So in, a, in a, just a few minutes, we're gonna be doing some subtraction as we 
and some addition as we combine two vectors and we're going to be sliding vectors around on the coordinate plane and the order in which we do our subtraction is going to be important because vectors have a beginning and an ending point, an initial and a terminal point. We can take a vector like vector v here <clears throat> and we can multiply it by a number which we call a scalar because it does in it does just that, it scales the vector up or down. This vector looks twice as long, even though it's uh, just a visual representation. That vector has twice the magnitude as vector v. This magnitude, or this vector has half the magnitude of vector v. But all three of these vectors are aiming in the same direction. This vector has been multiplied by a scalar that's negative. So the negative changes the direction. It reverses the direction. It aims the vector in the opposite direction. And the fact that this one is also being multiplied by three halves, it's not just uh, negating the vector, but it's a negative three halves, which is one and a half, also scales up the magnitude. So there's more magnitude, 50% more magnitude, and it's aiming in the opposite direction. So that's what happens when you multiply by a negative scalar. And we can add and subtract vectors together. We can move vectors around also in the plane as long as we do not change the magnitude and direction. If you want to change the magnitude or direction, you're going to be creating a new vector, all right? So on the left here, you're seeing that we can take vector u, which sort of aims off to the right, and vector v, which aims a little bit to the right and also substantially upward. And if we add them together, we end up with this new vector here, u plus v. Uh, it looks like it has more magnitude because visually it's being depicted as a longer vector. And its direction is different than vectors u and vector v. You can visually, sort of manually, tangibly add two vectors together by taking vector u, for example, leaving it where it is, and then taking vector v and putting vector v's initial point at the terminal point of vector u, so it's sort of a nose to tail situation there, and then vector v proceeds in its direction with its magnitude and then we connect the initial initial point to the terminal terminal point and we've got ourselves u plus v which is our new vector. To, on the right you're seeing a depiction of subtraction so adding or rather subtracting something is the same thing as adding the opposite for example 5 minus 2 is the same thing as 5 plus the, the opposite of 2 so that's what's happening here, v minus u, well here's vector v and here's vector u. Now how do we do v minus u? The first thing we do is we negate vector u. So there's the opposite of u, notice it's aiming to the left but with the same magnitude as the original vector u. And now we can, and if you want to write this out, v minus u is the same thing as v plus the opposite of u. So now we can take vector v, which is right here, and at the terminal point of vector v, we can put the opposite of vector u, which aims off to the left. And that's what that's the opposite of u down there. So just a couple of visual representations for you of how it is possible to perform basically what amounts to vector arithmetic. Uh, just off the top of my head, I think I want to draw this for you. Uh, I could take a vector that's aiming to the right with a magnitude of three and a second vector that's aiming up with a magnitude of two. And if I added those together, I would get this vector that aims up and to the right, and it has a different magnitude. It would be the 
square root of 15 or something would be the magnitude. Anyway, just to see that this purple vector is made up of a horizontal vector of magnitude 3 and a vertical vector of magnitude 2. I wanted to show you that because we're going to be working with that kind of uh, a scenario here in the not too distant future. The key part of this scenario maybe is that these two vectors, the blue ones, are perpendicular to each other. And I think maybe not until the next section we will say that those vectors, instead of perpendicular, we're going to say orthogonal. So just so that you have that word in your ear and it doesn't surprise you later. All right, so the I and J unit vectors, these are the, the atoms of the vector world, right? It's not uh, neutrons and electrons, and we're not going that small. Let's just go down to the atomic level, not subatomic. These are going to be the two different building blocks of all of our vectors. And in this diagram right here, I want to point out something to you. Every once in a while, it happens that a PDF does not convert correctly or print correctly or something. And I have found occasionally that, especially in this set of notes, that equal signs are only showing up with one of the two horizontal bars that make up an equal sign. So this does need to be an equal sign V equals AI plus BJ. And this I vector is a unit vector in the horizontal direction, the positive horizontal direction. The J unit vector has a magnitude of one and is aiming in the positive vertical direction. So here, vector V, which is, which is equal to AI plus BJ, is made up of how many I vectors? A of them. And how many J vectors? B of them. So let's see an example of that. I thought there was a... Yeah, here we go. So let's take this first vector, V equals 2I plus 3J, and sort of build it on this coordinate system over here to the right. I need two I's and three J's. So my I's are going in the horizontal direction. There's two of them and then three J's. So I'm going up and up and up. So there's the three of them. And then we can connect those and really be drawing our vector v. All right, so two horizontal vectors and three vertical vectors, and the result is vector v there. Now the second vector, v equals negative 5j, does not have an i component, and that's okay, so there's no horizontal component. We would just add or build 5j vectors. Those are vertical vectors, but they're aiming in the negative direction. So we could put together one, two, three, four, five of them aiming in the negative vertical direction. You add all those together and you get this downward pointing vector with magnitude five. Now I said magnitude five, even though there's a negative five in here, and we're gonna talk more specifically about magnitude in the not too distant future. But first I want you to see this and for us to talk about this because in the left hand diagram, you're seeing a vector that's sort of floating around in space there. And it has an initial point P1 and a terminal point P2. And there's a horizontal dashed line here and the length of that horizontal dashed line can be found by finding the difference between the x-coordinates. It's the terminal point's x-coordinate minus the initial point's x-coordinate. And similarly, the length of this vertical dashed line can be found by finding the difference between the y-components or the vertical components. This should, of course, say y2 minus y1. So please write that in by hand if you have that misprint sort of on your paper. If we go through that process and we 
find the difference between the x coordinates and the difference between the y coordinates, always the terminal value minus the initial value. So those do say x2 minus x1 and y2 minus y1 for a reason. They're in that order for a very specific reason. If we perform that arithmetic, what we get is a vector that still has an initial and a terminal point, except the initial point is at the origin. And when the initial point is at the origin, we can list our vector just using one ordered pair, which is a lot more concise way to represent a vector. So in the left-hand diagram, we had to give the coordinates of P1 and P2, but in the right-hand diagram over here, this is when we're allowed to describe our vector simply as AI plus BJ. There's a, an assumption that the starting point is at the origin there. That would make this your A value and this your B value. The amount of movement, so to speak, the amount of magnitude being applied in the horizontal and vertical directions. Let's write this vector in terms of i and j. We can do that, and let's try to keep as closely with the form that we're seeing at the top of our screen. So v is equal to, we have our second x coordinate, which is seven, minus the first one, which is a negative one. That's the uh, coefficient on i, that's how many horizontal unit vectors we have, plus y2, which is a negative 5, minus y1, which is 6. Oops, that's supposed to be a j. There we go. And that is equal to 8i minus 11j. So this is how we would express our vector in terms of i and j. It almost looks like a complex number horizontal coefficient and a vertical coefficient. Here it's the amount of i and the amount of j, as opposed to on the complex coordinate plane, it was the amount of real in the horizontal direction and the amount of imaginary in the vertical direction. Which brings us to the point where we're going to talk about operations. And these are the rules that vectors are going to abide by. And at the top of this list, you see that in order to add or subtract vectors, you need to add their horizontal components and add their vertical components or subtract them and subtract them. Uh, just below that, scalar multiplication with a vector in terms of i and j. Here's another misprint. This should say kv equals kai plus kbj. So the k is our scalar multiple. So it's, it's some number k times our vector v. And how do we make that happen? Well, imagine that k was a three. So the magnitude of our vector should triple. And how do we triple it? We triple the horizontal component or amount of i vectors, and we triple the number of j vectors. We're going to see examples of these. There is a zero vector, and here's another misprint for us. That should say zero equals zero i plus zero j. Of course, that ends up being represented just as a dot at the origin. Tough to determine the direction on that also. And here, the properties of vector addition mixed with scalar multiplication uh, all in this same list. Be aware that u, v, and w are representing vectors, that c and d are scalar multiples, and we have a commutative property, so it doesn't matter the order in which we add vectors together, the result will be the same. We have a commutative property, so if it's all addition or subtraction, then it doesn't matter the order in which we perform the arithmetic of the vectors. It's true that if you add a zero vector, 
to any other vector that you will simply get the original vector, in this case being represented by u. We have a little misprint here in number four. So this should say u plus negative u equals the opposite of u plus u equals zero. So it's true, even when you're working with vectors, that if you add opposites together, you do get zero. But this zero is actually the zero vector, not the zero scalar multiple. Seems strange to make this list, right? Like, it, isn't there always a commutative property and an associative property and a zero that when you add zero, nothing happens? And therefore, when you add opposites together, you get zero? Doesn't that always work that way? It doesn't always work that way. It depends on what algebra you're operating in or operating under. The algebra that we all grew up uh, learning in school, and if you think back really hard, you might be able to remember the first time you ever heard about these properties, commutative property, associative property, additive inverse, even I don't remember that one. But the first two I remember from when I was very young, and they tell us these things, they kind of gloss over them because most people don't actually end up going this far in math. But uh, if you've worked with matrices, you've discovered or learned that matrix algebra has its own set of rules, much like the ones that we're seeing on this screen. And some of the rules are different. Some of the rules are missing. Certainly the number zero when you're working with a matrix looks different, right? We don't even know what the dimensions of a zero matrix is uh, offhand. We have to be told what it is. Uh, what the dimensions are rather. So that's why we have this list. So let's see if I can speed up a little bit here. Uh, if you're multiplying by scalars, the order in which you do the scalar multiplication to the actual unit, uh, to the actual vector u, that order doesn't matter. There appears to be a distributive property. You can take a constant value c or a scalar multiple c and distribute it to the sum of two vectors. We've got a typo right here. This needs to be an equal sign, please. Uh, this is an interesting one in number three. This says that we can add our scalars together first and then do the multiplication. Or we could, this is so strange, it looks like we're distributing the vector into the scalar addition from the right. Okay, so... So it's a little a little strange, but I guess uh, what this is saying is that three plus four uh, candy bars is the same thing as saying three candy bars plus four candy bars. Uh, either way, you're going to end up with seven candy bars. Why I chose candy bars, I have no idea. It's just the first thing that came to mind. But please make sure you make that an equal sign. Uh, the number one... You can multiply by the number one and you get the same unit. Okay, that's an important property of an algebra. If you take and multiply by the scalar zero, we do get the zero vector. And finally, there's this thing. This is the magnitude property and we have not talked about this yet. However, uh, much like taking the absolute value of a complex number, Remember that the absolute value of a complex number a plus bi was equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. We're going to do pretty much the same thing when we find the magnitude. That's a double bar. When we find the magnitude of a vector, we're going to be doing very similar arithmetic to what you're seeing right here. And we'll talk about that specifically uh, in a moment. However, what's happening here is that if you have the magnitude of a vector that's being multiplied by a scalar, you're allowed to factor out the scalar, but you have to put that scalar, that number, in traditional absolute value bars, and then multiply that positive number by whatever the magnitude of the actual vector is. Or you can do this multiplication first, get an a, uh, a modified vector and then find its magnitude. So the order in which you do, do those things doesn't matter. So let's check out some examples. Here we've got 3u plus 4v. Now 3u 
is equal to three times 2i minus 5j, and we're adding to that four times vector v, which is negative 3i plus 7j. I'm going to distribute my scalar multiple and this scalar multiple into my vector, or my vectors. So I have now 6i minus 15j plus negative 12i plus 28j. Now adding a negative 12i, you are absolutely welcome to turn this into a minus sign. And if you had already written it as a minus sign, leave it as a minus sign, totally fine. Now basically, so this was distribute, and now pretty much I'm gonna combine like terms. I'm going to combine the horizontal components, which is the 6i and the negative 12i, and then separately we'll add the vertical components that are there. So 6i minus 12i is negative 6i, and negative 15 plus 28 is positive 13, so that is plus 13j. And that is our new vector. Here's an opportunity for us to talk about magnitude. So this is equal to the absolute value of negative two times the magnitude of vector u, which is the two i minus five j. How is it that we have a magnitude problem and we haven't talked about magnitude yet? I've gotta go back up and make sure that I didn't miss something. Sometimes I'm talking and I'm thinking and I'm anticipating what's coming next and I end up glossing over something, and I don't want to do that. Sketch each vector and find its magnitude, find its magnitude. We must have talked about magnitude. Mm, it's not there. It's nowhere to be found. It's no wonder I didn't talk about it, because there's not really a spot for it. Uh, okay, let's come back to here. This is, I'm at the top of page three. Sorry about that. Uh, let's talk about magnitude, okay? The magnitude of vector v is equal to the magnitude of, oops, double bar there, the magnitude of ai plus bj, right? Because our vector can be represented using i and j unit vector components. And to find the magnitude of this vector, we are going to take the square root of a squared plus b squared, just like the distance formula, just like the absolute value of a complex number. This is just a slightly different arena and representation of sort of similar ideas, I suppose. Let's find the vector real quick of this first vector v. Magnitude of vector v here is equal to the magnitude, if you want to write that out, of 2i plus 3j. Double bars now for the magnitude. That's equal to the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared, which is equal to the square root of 4 plus 9, which is the square root of 13. So that is the magnitude of that vector. Let's move back down and pick up where we were farther along in the notes because we have another magnitude we need to calculate. There we are. So the magnitude of 2i minus 5j, we can say that this is equal to, now the absolute value of negative two is just what you think it is, it's a two. And then the magnitude of that vector, the u vector, is the square root of two squared plus negative five squared, which is equal to two times the square root of four plus 25. Four plus 25 is 29. And the square root of 29 cannot be simplified. Therefore, this is our magnitude. Is it possible to get a negative magnitude? It is not. It's not and it's not. If there's a negative number here, we pull it out and we take the absolute value. This is always gonna be the square root of a positive number because a squared is positive plus b squared is positive, positive plus positive is positive. We're gonna take the square root, forget about the plus or minus, we're only using the positive when we calculate magnitude.
Now the phrase unit vectors is not new to us. The u and, or sorry, the i and j vectors are both unit vectors, but they're very specific ones. The i unit vector points to the right, the j unit vector points up. And here, a unit vector we're being told is any vector with magnitude one. Visually, it looks like it has a length of one. When we were graphing or plotting or sketching some of those vectors and we did the couple of horizontal i unit vectors and three vertical j unit vectors, each one of those like one square was equal to one of those unit vectors. So that's maybe fairly common to use that kind of representation. However, those were just the horizontal and vertical ones. It's possible to have a unit vector that goes off at an angle. And we can take actually any vector v and we can either shrink it or stretch it if necessary in order to make it be a unit vector. And we do that by taking the vector and dividing it by its own magnitude. So here, this says 8i minus 6j. Now where would that be? It's eight in the horizontal direction. It's six in the negative direction. So our vector would point out here toward this point. And if you perform the Pythagorean theorem, you would see that a horizontal of eight and a vertical of negative six, the square root of eight squared plus negative six squared would be the square root of 100 and the hypotenuse, so to speak, the magnitude of this vector would be 10. And in fact, we need to do that anyway, so let's write that out. The magnitude of vector v is equal to the square root of eight squared plus negative six squared, which is equal to 10. Um, what we're going to do is modify that magnitude by taking our vector and dividing it by its own magnitude. All right, so vector v divided by the magnitude of v is equal to 8i minus 6j over 10. And we are allowed to distribute division when we're applying it to a vector. So I'm going to write this as 8 tenths i minus 6 tenths j. And now I'll reduce. Sometimes the first component on, or the first coefficient on i will be able to reduce a little bit further or not as far as the coefficient on j. But here they're both going to reduce by the same amount. This turns into 4 fifths i minus 3 fifths j. And if you found the magnitude of that vector, you would find that it has a magnitude of 1. It would be the square root of 16 25ths plus 9 25ths, which makes the square root of 25 25ths. So the square root of one, which is one. So there's an example of the process of calculating a unit vector. And now let's get a little bit more specific about the direction that these vectors are aiming, if we can say it that way. And the example that we're seeing here has our vector pointing into the second quadrant so our theta value would be larger than pi over two, and we can calculate that theta value by looking at these relationships. These look pretty familiar. If I multiplied both sides of these equations by the magnitude of v, we would have that the magnitude of v times cosine theta is equal to a, and that the magnitude of v times the sine of theta is equal to b. This looks a lot like x equals r cosine theta and y, the vertical stuff, equals r sine theta. Hmm. Is it really that similar? Should it be that familiar to me? Yeah. That's the great news is I'm teaching you something, I'm showing you something right now that you already know. It's just being presented in a slightly different way, but this is not new stuff that we're looking at right here, okay?
we'd like to write this vector in terms of i and j. Interesting. Okay, so we're going to be using those little formulas uh, on the previous page. And, oh man, I'm trying to remember them. I think I might default back to r cosine theta equals x. And then I can translate that x is the horizontal stuff, which is a in this case. And r is actually the magnitude of whatever our vector is. And the cosine theta was the same. Okay, that's the formula that I need. That reminds me that the other formula I need is the magnitude of my vector times the sine of my angle measure, and that's equal to my vertical component. Okay, and oh good, I know the magnitude and the angle measure. That's gonna make this a lot easier. So this is equal to 10 times the cosine of 330. That's gonna be my A value, and 10 times the sine of 330 degrees will be my vertical component. Uh, cosine of 330. That's 30 degrees short of a full rotation, so I'm high in the fourth quadrant, and cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's gonna be root three over two. So I've got 10 times the square root of three over two, that's equal to A, and the sine of 330, uh, that is a negative one for an opposite side length divided by a hypotenuse of two. So we've got 10 times negative one over two is equal to our B value. So if we do a little simplifying right here with the 10 and the two, that turns into five root three for an A value. And a negative five for a B value. So we can represent a vector V using i and j notation, or in terms of i and j, and we have five root three i unit vectors, plus, oh, it's minus because it's negative five, so minus five vertical unit j vector components. And there's your answer. So just a little process for you. Now, some of us have more difficulty remembering processes like this, and so I always encourage you, if possible, to draw a diagram. At 330 degrees, my vector looks like this. It has a magnitude of 10. Now, how far in the horizontal, or how, how much magnitude is there going in the horizontal direction? How much magnitude is there coming down in the vertical direction? And remember that this angle right in here, as a reference angle, hold still, there you go. This reference angle right here is 30 degrees. And, and these i and j unit vectors or components are perpendicular to each other. So this is the 30, 60, 90 triangle with a hypotenuse of 10. Well, the hypotenuse of 10, the short leg of my triangle better be half of the hypotenuse, which makes it five, but it's in the negative direction and the long leg of my 30, 60, 90 triangle is equal to the short leg times rad three. So that makes this five times the square root of three. Look at your A and B values. They're five root three and negative five. This is not new stuff. So if you need to revert back to the old ways and drawing some diagrams and think about the Sokotoa relationships that sine and cosine describe, do that. It's a f I got the answer way faster than I did by going through all this magnitude of v cosine theta equals a blah 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 blah. I just did it the same way I've been doing it, I don't know, for like six weeks. And I got the answer super fast. Now it doesn't always work this nicely because your reference angle isn't always going to be a 30 or a 60 or a a 45 or even a 90 potentially. It's not It's not gonna be a quadrantal angle. So in the instances where your theta value is something lousy like 57 degrees, you're gonna to have to know the first method that we used when we did all of this stuff, okay? You gotta know that. But if it's a more familiar set of circumstances and you wanna do the old school route, great. If you wanna do this sort of new school way and then do the old school way to check yourself and, and make sure that you did indeed get the correct answer, you can use it as a good way to check your own work. 
this is a great example. This theta value is not gonna be nice. And in fact, we should do this one because the process is a little bit different. So the magnitude of V is not difficult. You can do that. But let's find the direction angle. Now, the, well, all right. In order to, to use this kind of stuff and more specifically to use this stuff, we really do need the magnitude. So let's calculate the magnitude. The magnitude of V, I'm like begrudgingly calculating the magnitude. Grumble, grumble, grumble. Here I am in air conditioning, I'm making videos while wearing pajama pants, and I'm complaining. I mean, come on. How easy do we have it? You're sitting in air conditioning probably somewhere looking at a computer screen. How fortunate are you? Pretty fortunate is my guess if you think about it. Just doing arithmetic, just hanging out, doing arithmetic with you. Uh, this is 25. How many quarters are there in $3.25? Four and four and four in the first $3. That's 12 and an extra quarter makes 13 quarters. Uh, okay, so we can write this as five root 13. Lovely, there's our magnitude. We can put a box around that. That was a specific part of the question. And then what we were doing previously with these two statements, we're gonna use those again right now. So the magnitude of V times the cosine of theta is equal to A. We just calculated the magnitude of V to be five root 13 times the cosine of, we don't know what theta is, but that's equal to A which if you look at the original vector, a is negative 10. Let's do some arithmetic and divide both sides by five root 13. There's no need for me to rationalize my denominator on the right side because I don't care what it is really. What I'm looking for honestly is my theta value which can be found by taking the inverse cosine of both sides of our equation. So what we really need now is a calculator, and I would say let's put it in degree mode so that when we get an actual theta value, we'll be able to tell with some certainty which quadrant the theta value is actually directing us to. All right, so I'm clearing a couple times. I'm in degree mode, great. And on my scientific calculator, I'm going to type in 10 divided by... 13 square root equals, now I've got 2.7735 on the screen, but I haven't done the division by five yet. So now I'm gonna hit divided by five equals, and I got 0.5547. And now I'm gonna hit the second button and then the cosine button in order to take the inverse cosine. I got ner nervous for a second there. I was like 0.55 degrees, I don't think so. And indeed, that was not correct. The correct value is 56.31 rounded. 0.31 degrees. We could go through this same process using the sine function, but why? We would just find the same theta value. At least I'm pretty sure we'd find the same theta value. What do I know? Uh, so I've put a box around that, but I didn't mean to do that. Let me erase the box that I put around it because I need to ask myself one more question. Why do I need to ask myself one more question, you might ask? Because I just performed or used an inverse trig function. And we know that inverse trig functions return angle measures that are only in two out of the four quadrants. Now, what if my angle measure is really supposed to be in a different quadrant? So the inverse cosine function 
is capable of returning angle measures that are in the first or second quadrant. Remember, don't write this down, just watch this. Mm, inverse cosine. It should return angle measures in the first or second quadrant. Yep. Uh, oh, you know what? It's this is a, it's good that I was about to do this, but uh, let me actually back up. Sorry. If this terrible looking decimal is still on the screen of your calculator, the fifty six point three zero nine 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 or nine nine three whatever, uh, just hit the cosine button, would you? It gives us this point five five four seven number again. So what I've done is I've gone back to the point in the process right before I took the inverse cosine. So what I'm looking at on my screen currently is 10 divided by 5 root 13. The reason I've gone back to this point is because I forgot to make this value negative before I took the inverse cosine. So I'm in the bottom right corner of this calculator. I'm going to hit this plus minus button. So now the value on my screen is a negative 0 0.55470019619. Now I'm going to hit second and cosine. I got an angle measure of 123.69 degrees. So please make that change in your notes here. 123.69, yep. Well, Okay, so I'm not going to put my box around it yet, because now I need to ask myself a question, because I just used the inverse cosine function. An inverse cosine is only capable of returning angle measures that are in the first or second quadrant. But what if my theta value actually needs to be in the third or fourth quadrant? Well, I only need to answer that question if, in this problem, indeed my theta value is supposed to be in the third or fourth quadrant. Let's see where it's supposed to be. If I sketched this vector, I would have to go negative 10 or left 10 horizontal units and then up 15 units in the positive vertical direction. So I'm actually in the second quadrant with this one. And look at the theta value that we have in the bottom right corner of the screen. That is 123.69 degrees, which is about 33.69 degrees into the second quadrant, right? It's it's uh, 33.69 degrees more than 90 degrees. So this is actually a good theta value. Let's put a little note up here that says V is in the second quadrant. And then let's put a note here that says in second quadrant, and then Let's just put a little note here that says these two things match. We're very happy about that. If they didn't match, we might have to add 180 degrees or subtract 180 degrees or something like that. Okay, so just be careful. Please make sure to do that one last little check. Yeah, all we would have to do is take that plus 15j at the top of the screen and make it a minus 15j, and that would drop us into the third quadrant. Except this negative 10 is this negative 10 is this negative 10 is this negative 10. The negative 15 didn't come into play in our calculation of theta. So this process would have still returned a theta value in the second quadrant, except we were supposed to be in the third quadrant. I think maybe we should have that conversation while we're here. I'm going to switch pen colors and say that if V equals negative 10 I minus 15 J, then our diagram should look like this. V is in three, and then that does not match with this. It's a very sad face. Okay, we don't like that those two don't match. 
and we have to do something about that theta value. So what are our options? Option number one is, if you look at the top of your screen right up here, we could figure out this reference angle because that reference angle, if you look back down here, that reference angle up there is the same as this reference angle right here. So we could take our theta value of 123.69 and we could add that reference angle twice and it would land us in the third quadrant. The other option is, since cosine did not put us into the correct quadrant, we could try the sine function and I'm pretty sure that I know what's gonna happen if we do this with the sine function, so I'm going to go for it. And I'm gonna say that the magnitude of V times the sine of theta is equal to our B value. So uh, we had a magnitude of five root 13 times the sine of theta is equal to our B value was a, now I'm, I'm saying it's gonna be a negative 15 in this example. Okay, put that back. And now I'm going to divide both sides by five root 13 and I'm going to take the inverse sine so that theta is equal to negative 15, sorry, is equal to the inverse sine of negative 15 over five root 13. And let's jump into the calculator and do that. And hopefully I can remember to do all of the steps this time. So I'm going to take the positive 15. Well, first I'm gonna clear a couple times. I'm checking, I'm still in degree mode, good, okay. I'm gonna take the 15 and I'm gonna make it negative right away. That way I don't forget this time. And then I will hit divided by 13 square root equals, I've got negative 4.16. Then I'm gonna divide by the five. So divided by five equals, and I've got negative 0.83205. And now I'm going to do the inverse sine function. So let's hit second and then the sine button. And I got negative 56.31 degrees. Clearly, that is not in the third quadrant. It's in the fourth quadrant. We're just dancing all around where we really want to be. Try this on your calculator with that lousy negative 56.300 or 0 0.3099 number on your screen. Hit plus 180 equals. And I got that same stupid theta value that's in the second quadrant. Okay, so this is a little tricky. We're going to need to calculate that reference angle and add it twice. So I apologize, this is turning into a little bit of a mess. I, I had the notion to go through this process down here with you. This is I'm just doing this on the fly. I thought maybe that the inverse sine function was going to return an angle measure in the first quadrant and then we could just add 180 to it, but I uh, guessed wrong. I didn't give it too much thought before I just pulled the trigger and went ahead and did this process and we landed in the fourth quadrant, which is not where we wanted to be. So I'm going to switch back to blue for a blue pen, and I'm going to draw my original diagram, which is up at the very top right corner of the screen, but I'm gonna draw the third and fourth, or sorry, the second and third quadrants. I've got my vector V, I have my theta value here, which is 123.69. Uh, you know what, I should not be doing this in blue. All of this should be in red. This is what I get for winging it. If you're using two different pen colors and you can just dr start drawing in red on top of what we've got here so far, that would be good. 
there's the 123.69. And then this angle measure in here is 180 minus 123.69. So I'm gonna call this, and of course we've got a quick blackout here. So let's pause for just another few seconds. Three, two, one. It's pretty close on the timing. I'm gonna call this theta prime. <clears throat> and I'm also going to draw my actual vector that we're doing in this red example part of the problem where I modified the original vector and made it a B value of negative 15 so that we would uh, end up in the third quadrant. So I'm calling that theta prime, which means that this is also theta prime. because we are to the left 10 units, and here we're vertical 15 units, and here we are vertical 15 units in the negative direction. So these are identical triangles just reflected over the horizontal axis. So what is 180? Where should we write this? Theta prime equals 180 minus 123.69 which is equal to 56.31. And now what I need to do is my original theta value of 123.69, and I need to add the theta value twice so that we can push this hypotenuse all the way into the third quadrant so it ends up here. Well, 123.69 plus 56.31 is 180. So I'm going to take this 56.31 or 3099 number that's already on the screen of my calculator and I'm going to add 180 to it. If you want to write out the notes that really match with the diagram, you should write down that theta is equal to 123.69 plus 2 times theta prime, which is equal to 236.31. That is the theta value that goes along with this vector. Sorry that got a little a little convoluted. It's kind of overlapping the stuff in red and the stuff in blue. They're definitely related. What I recommend that you do is that you write down this vector and try to find its magnitude and its direction angle theta. Okay, follow these instructions. Find the magnitude of V and the direction angle, but do it with this vector that I've circled in red right here. I don't think you'll have any trouble finding the magnitude. It's still going to be five root 13. However, try to find the direction angle theta on your own. I think you'll find that it's a little bit tricky. I think you'll find that you calculate theta to be either toward the top right, you'll calculate it to either be 123.69 or in at the very bottom of your screen, you'll calculate it to equal negative 56.31. Based on the sketch of this vector, which is in the third quadrant, you're gonna realize that neither of those theta values point in the third quadrant. And so you'll need to try to figure out what to do to make the theta value correct. See if you can figure it out. If you can't figure it out on your own, you're welcome to use this process in order to get this as your correct theta value, 236.31 degrees. So use that as a practice problem for yourself, please, because it's very possible that you're going to 
be asked to work with a vector in the third quadrant, and you're going to have to do this little bit of additional work in order to get the correct theta value. All right, that was a substantial problem to wrap up that first segment of our two segment video conversation about vectors. So if you would be so kind as to click on the box directly below me, that will take you to the next segment, which is our conversation and examination of two examples of applications of vectors. See you there.